Saints. Good morning. Good morning. Small crowd in the room today. Lots of people are traveling today uh, for this weekend. Uh, moving toward Thanksgiving. I know my college kids will be coming in this week. So traveling mercies and prayers for lots of people. Um, prayers for Stessa today. Stessa is home with COVID. She uh, was feeling puny. Started texting me probably about Wednesday. I was out of town. And uh, when I got home Friday evening, I said, have you by any chance tested yourself? And we tested her. And sure enough, she has COVID. So she is locked in her bedroom at the moment. <laughs> well, we were heard this morning. My mother was had, came down with a cold, so they tested her, and she has COVID, oh. and she's in the nursing home. But there's several on her floor that does, and they're monitoring her. And those are still Catherine Hardy. There she is. Um, if you happen to have lost a USB to USB C. After. I have it. I found it right there this morning. <laughs> I think that's from marrying older technology to newer technology, and I don't know why it was right there this morning, but if you lost it, there it is, right there. Um, this evening will be our Thanksgiving service. We'll meet at the Methodist Church at 6 p.m. Uh, that's the community-wide thing. Carol will be um, representing us with her Thanksgiving testimony. Uh, each church does that, so um, we will uh, all be together doing that thing. Um, Charlotte is on our list. She had a run of tachycardia last week and has had an ablation done and is doing better. She's back home. Anybody heard about Penny? And he had a heart thing happen last week too and ended up in the hospital in Odessa. Penny Meckle? Yes. Um, so, that's what I know. Carol? We're changing the second hymn to 428 to make it a more familiar hymn to success and not hear with a strong voice. <laughs> so everybody be alert. Second hymn to 428. Yeah, I texted her and I told her if I didn't know the hymn, I would just change it to one that I could get through. <laughs> Fair enough. This is a five. Fair enough. The, uh, when I was in seminary the last year and a half, I would drive out on the weekends to Rock Springs and I'd spend the day kind of hanging around Rock Springs doing pastoral stuff. And then on Sunday, I would preach, and then after lunch, that's when I would go back to Austin, where I'd go back to school, and she'd go back to work. Uh, and so I would send all of the bulletin information, much like I do to Carol. Um, I, I'll email it. Uh, back then, I faxed it uh, to uh, <coughs> a lady who was a member of that church and worked in the local feed store, and she would build the bulletin. And I started off by, I would always select the hymns, and by the time I got to church on Sunday morning, uh, the organist and pianist had gone together and completely changed the hymns oh. every week. So I just quit picking hymns all together and just let them do it. So, uh, there is a history here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. You'll find our bullet. No, you won't find our bulletin and hymns online this week. I think I failed to do that. Um, so, anything else? Join me in a responsive call to worship. To you, O God of the heavens, we lift our eyes. Have mercy on us. God has been our dwelling place from generation to generation. Hear us when we call. From everlasting to everlasting, God is with us. We will magnify your holy name. Good and gracious and almighty God, we stand before you in awe as we come into this place knowing that you are our God and you created us to be your people. <clears throat> and so in this hour, we ask that you would help us to silence any voice but your own. Help us to hear and see and know only you. That as we go from this place, we might be refreshed and renewed to carry your love and your grace 
to the whole world. For we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. First Timothy is 455, right? <clears throat>
Anyone who's in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone, and the new life has begun. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus, Jesus Christ, we are created. chapter 25, verses 14 through 30. Would you rise with me, please, in honor of reading the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hear the word of the Lord as it's spoken to you. For as, as if a man were going on a journey, he summoned his slaves and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, and to each according to his ability. Then he went away. 
The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them and made five more talents. In the same way, the one who had, who had the two talents made two more talents, but the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and, did it, and, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Master, you handed me five talents. See, I have made five more talents. And his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one with two talents also came forward, saying, Master, you handed over me two talents. See, I have made two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy slave. You have been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Master, I know that you are a harsh man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not get scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground, and here you have what is yours. But his master replied, You wicked and lazy slave. You know, did you, you knew, did you, that I reap where I sow and I gather where I do not scatter. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one with ten talents. For to all those who have more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But for those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless slave, throw him in the corner of darkness, in the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Friends in Christ, believe it or not, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Today we have yet another talent brought to you by Jesus. And again, I say this all the time when we talk about talents, I will tell you again that you can push these things too far. Parables are almost never a direct parallel to life. They are stories that illustrate a very specific point most of the time. And in this case, we need only to consider the amount of money involved to really understand that this is not a real story because it is frankly an eye-watering amount of money. One talent is the same is the equivalent of 6,000 denarii and the denarius is the daily wage for the average unskilled worker. Now because you have the ability to google things like me I will tell you that there are articles out there that estimate one talent as being the equivalent of $1,418,400 in today's money. That, in my mind, is an overestimation, and I'll tell you why. That number comes from uh, a guy named Mark Gizak, who is a Roman Catholic author, author uh, who has a lot of good things to say. I've got nothing bad to say about Mark Gizak at all. I just disagree with him on this one point, and only because he estimates the value of the talent based on the medium hourly wage in the United States in 2022 as being $29.55 per hour. That's the way he got his estimate. That's fair enough, I suppose, but I don't think the denarius was the equivalent of the median hourly wage because it's for the poorest of the poor. The denarius was the very minimum a person could be paid. It was literally the least coin. It was what a low-skilled worker, an unskilled worker made uh, when they went to work for a full day, but they were given a denarius at the end of the day. So in my mind, we're better off comparing the denarius to minimum wage uh, in today's world, uh, which is still uh, a simple $7.25 $7.25 per hour, or $58 per eight hour day. And if we go that route, then the talent is worth closer to $348,000. Fair enough? That's one talent. Now, which one of us is correct? 
I don't think we can accurately make a judgment uh, if I were to be honest, but all we can do uh, is fairly share with folks the method by which we came up with our figures and let you make the judgment. But suffice it to say that a talent is worth somewhere between $348,000 and $1,418,400. Bit of a little bit of a difference there, right? In either case, it's 6,000 days or about 16 and a half years worth of work. One talent is a lot of money. On that, I think we can agree. Now, as we think about our parable today, that's the amount the landowner gives to the person he trusts the least. That's the amount he gave to the guy who took the money and buried it in the ground. For the other two, he gives twice that amount and five times that amount, respectively. Using McKissick's numbers, uh, or Mark McKissick's numbers, I spelled that badly, um, that's a little bit over nine million uh, in today's dollar, dollars, or by my figures, a little less than two million for the slave who was entrusted with five talents. In either case, a million here and a million there. Sooner or later, we're talking about real money. So now that we know about the amount of cash we're talking about here, we also need to know that the master here did not get all that money by being a nice guy. By his own admission, he reaps where he does not sow, and he gathers where he does not scatter seed, and we have a word for that. He's a thief, right? Reaping what he does not sow and gathering what he, where he does not scatter seed means he reaps what somebody else sowed. He gathers seed that somebody else scattered. He steals other people's crops, and he has made a heck of a living doing it. He's made himself rich doing that. He's not a nice guy. He also, by the way, uh, tells that last slave, why didn't you just invest it with the bankers and make interest off of it? By the way, that's usury. That's a thing that's also against Jewish law. This is not a nice guy. There's a reason that this last slave buried that talent in the ground. He was afraid of his boss and what his boss might do to him. Now again, this is a parable, so I don't want to push you too far. Uh, but I have no idea what it takes to double one's income in antiquity. Or how long that might have taken. Jesus says here in Matthew that it took a long time before he came back. It must have been a really long time. Because I know it's not easy to double your money in today's world. At least not in any legal way. Yet these two slaves somehow managed to make it happen for their master, even without things like the stock market and casinos and lottery and all that stuff. Somehow, however, in Jesus' imagination, they made it happen. And I think a final interpretive note is important here because I have heard way too often uh, that we're really not talking about money here. What we're talking about is talents in the modern sense. That is, taking and talking about skills and abilities that allow us to succeed at certain tasks. Uh, I've heard that said a bunch of times, and I disagree with it completely. Uh, the words translated here from Greek are specifically dealing with money. It's talents, as in money, as in 6,000 days of work. Having said that, I don't think we have to go too far to make the hermeneutical leap, hermeneutical leap, that is, we can interpret this parable to mean all sorts of things, because ultimately what Jesus says is those who are given, to those who are given much, uh, they are expected to do much more with it. And I believe we can apply that lesson to any number of gifts, but I don't want to skip over the money conversation either. That's not the only conversation we need to have. Uh, but it's my true belief that if every follower of this church were to tithe, we would have no money problem at all. Tithing is a spiritual discipline. 
It's a thing we are called to do. And I would ask each person within earshot to consider the, per the importance of both your spiritual discipline and the financial health of this part of Christ's church. If you take a look at the finances in our bulletin, we bring in just a little over half of what it takes to actually keep this place running day by day. And if we want, to, we want this place to be around for the next generation, we have to do better. But tithing is by far not the only spiritual discipline. And I think a fair reading of this parable must consider that none of us are the kinds of people who double the gifts we've been given every moment of our lives as these slaves seem to be able to do, at least the first two. Just like life, we have our good days and our bad days when it comes to the practice of our faith, I believe. Some days we do extremely well. Some days, not so much. I think there are times, for instance, that I am a five-talent Christian. There are days when I get up in the morning with all the energy I will ever need. There are days when I am just gung-ho for Jesus. There are Sundays when I feel as though my servant has gone spot on. Just that I've done as well as I possibly could. And there are days of the week when I'm able to find time to visit everyone I'm called to visit, study everything I want to study, write everything I think I need to write, and still find the time and energy to spend a good amount of time in prayer. There are even times in my life when I have a little extra money in the bank and I'm able to give a little extra to the church. And another huge part of my ministry is my work in EMS. A lot of that is frankly humdrum work, if I'm honest. A huge number of the 911 calls are not really emergencies. Many people who are transported by ambulance don't always need an ambulance, but there are days when there are real emergencies and my training and experience kick in and we have truly worked to truly save lives. And I will tell you that that feels really good when that happens. There are days when I am able to speak truth against injustice, but find ways to do that with patience and love. Some days, I'm a five-talent Christian. Some days, I get it right. Some days, I feel really great at the end of the day. But most days, if I'm honest, I'm probably a two-talent Christian at most. Most days I can be trusted to do my best, but my best is not the best. There are days when I don't have all of the energy I need to, to put into writing sermons and preaching. Believe it or not, some days I just don't feel energetic enough to get up here and give you all I've got. There are those days when I have a bad attitude and don't spend the kind of time I should in prayer. There are days I worry about money and personal finances. There are days that I regret or even begrudge EMS tones going off, even though I still respond and do my best. There are days when I am more angry than I should be and have very little patience for those who don't follow Jesus and his teachings, especially those who claim to be Christians when it comes to things, the things they think, say, and do. There are things, there are days when I do okay, and nobody would ever know it, but I'm not 100% into this thing called Christianity on those days. I am far from perfect. Most days, I am a two-talent Christian, I should think. And there are very few and far between. But some days, maybe three or four days out of the year, I bury the whole thing in the dirt. I'm not feeling well at all. I'm completely out of energy. I have zero patience for other people and their antics. And I hope that no one ever gets to see me on those days. 
I am keenly aware when I'm having a bad day. It's not a good day for me, and it's not a good day for the church. There are those days when I need to make, take a mental health day and do nothing, and especially have no interaction with people because I know I will not represent Jesus well. As it turns out, ministers are people too, just like you. And we have really bad days, and when that happens, I hope Stessa is the only one that knows it. And I hope I'm gentle enough with her to say, this is time for me to take a day off. And it's not surprising, I usually work seven days a week and I love it. But sometimes, very rarely, I have to stop and regroup. And on those days, I'm burying everything Christ has given me. I'm burying it up to its neck in the dirt and sharing with no one, and certainly not bearing fruit for Jesus. Some days, I bury all of my faith in the dirt. So that's me. And here's the thing, I think you may be the same way. There are days when we all have five talent days, and those days are the days that we help carry others through. We should all strive every day to have five talent days as Christians, but most days, if we're honest, are two talent days, where we do our best, but the best is not the best no matter how hard we try, and some days, we have really bad days, don't we? Some days they're hard and we bury it all in the sand, and those are the days when the church itself and the faith of the church carries us. Because the church always has five talent days when we are earnestly and honestly being the body of Christ. Pray. Almighty and merciful God, we give you thanks for those five talent days. Even as we ask forgiveness for those one talent days. We ask, O oh God, that you would give us the energy as the church of Jesus Christ to do the right thing every moment to seek to double all that you have given us, to build upon our faith and your church, that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, for we pray it in his holy name. Amen. I stand and say what we believe in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, <coughs> was crucified and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our hymn has changed to number 428. <coughs> Thank you.
God, we turn now to you, asking that you would bless us and keep us all on these days. As loved ones travel to and fro as this nation moves toward family, as we move toward an opportunity to give you thanks by way too much indulgence. We ask that you would keep us all safe and bring us all back home to the place that we belong, that we might continue to work for your glory. We pray especially for those who are gathered around table with missing loved ones. For those who will spend that first Thanksgiving this year, that first holiday season, without their loved ones, especially the families of A.G. and April. We give you thanks that Charlotte's doing better and we lift up Penny to you as she recovers. We pray for Jenny as her family tries to figure out what it is that is the right thing to do. Marisa as her arm heals and as she tries to take care of family herself. We pray for Alan and Kenny, Larry and Virgil, and all those who are suffering any number of medical issues. We look up to you. And then there's all those with cancer, that ever-growing list, O oh God, Taloa and Ron, Rod and Carol, and Tim and Marilyn and Mark, Carly, Melissa, Don, Susan, Charleston, Ian, Wanda, Michelle. The list that goes on and on and on of loved ones who share or who have been diagnosed with some sort of cancer. We need to be treated for that thing. We ask that you bless the doctors and nurses who treat them also with those who seek the cure, that we might stop adding to this list, that we might praise you for that cure, that we might not live in fear. We pray, O oh God, for those who are getting a little older, for Alvin and Catherine, especially Catherine, and she and Stessa both suffer today from COVID. For Pat, as she gets settled in her new digs, and Jean, Marjorie, and Emmeline, we pray, oh God, that you would help us to remind these people every day that we love them, and help us to be reminded every day that we need their wisdom. We pray for Caleb and everything that Caleb represents for us for senseless violence, for hate for the sake of hate, for frustration ever growing by a media that likes to keep us angry with one another. We pray for Caleb's healing, but we pray for the healing of a nation. May we truly beat our swords into plowshares and our spears into pruning hooks and stop senseless violence. We pray for Allison and Rudy as they work toward what comes next. As they seek out the right thing to do as they learn every day to do what it means to live with ALS. And finally, oh God, we lift up one voice and pray together the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught all of us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's return to God a small portion of the great many gifts.
things just up to you, asking that you would multiply them like loaves and fish, for we do give you thanks. Recognizing these as gifts that have come from, to, from you and returning them to you as the first fruits of our labors. And so we ask, O oh God, that you would multiply them like loaves and fish on the side of that lake and help us to build upon your work and your ministry that every day you should bow and every tongue should confess. That Jesus Christ is Lord. We pray in His name. Amen. Jesus Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit, be with you all now and forevermore.